Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. This is an event of the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles. And my name is Kenneth Whitwer. I'm the current chair of science and meetings for ISEV. So welcome to everyone who's joining today. We have a very interesting session for you. Um, our guest speakers are Mariola Edelman and Tanu Barr. Um, so they are at University of Florida. So there are some, uh, some gators. We were just talking about the the lakes there around, around Gainesville in Florida. And Melissa Jones is the corresponding author on this paper that appeared recently in the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles. But unfortunately, Melissa was, um, was not able to present today, but we're very happy that Tanu and Mariola are here to share with us this interesting work on the interplay of viruses, commensal bacteria in the gut. I would like to hand this over to you now, uh, Tanu, to uh, do the screen sharing. Thanks so much for joining. Today's discussion will be on the paper of interaction with mammalian enteric viruses, which alters outer membrane production and content by commensal bacteria. First of all, thank you for inviting us here today. And I am Sutonuka. Everyone can call me Tanu. I was the co-first author along with Chanel for this paper. And we were co-supervised by Dr. Edelman and Dr. Jones for our research. We work on multi-kingdoms, mainly with virus, commensal bacteria, and host responses towards them. In this study, we work with human norovirus. Human norovirus are typically self-limiting, uh, causes diarrheal disease with symptoms such as diarrhea, nausea, nausea, and vomiting. They are generally called two-bucket disease because obviously they have both symptoms. <clears throat> they are currently the leading cause of gastrointestinal disease worldwide. Annually, it causes around 685 million infections. And in US itself, it causes around uh, 19 to 21 million infections. And this causes a significant mortality in developing na nations, especially in children below the age of five. And the mortality is not because of the infection itself, but more because of the body's response towards the infection in form of diarrhea and dehydration. Although norovirus infection is so common, it is, there is relatively little knowledge about the virus's pathogenesis. And the main reason behind this is because of the lack of any robust cultivation technique for human norovirus, which limits our human norovirus production in labs in vitro, and which also limits any studies on antiviral therapeutics or vaccines for this disease. So what researchers are more focusing on these days are finding out other factors which can limit or enhance this norovirus infection. Noroviruses are known to infect immune cells in, present in the lamina propria, but to go there because they infect via fecal oral route, they have to cross the intestinal lumen and mucosal layer to reach the lamina propria and target immune cells. While they are crossing the intestinal lumen and mucosal layer, they interact with various commensal bacteria present in the microbiome over there. And it is known that enteric viruses can, in general, cause a large-scale dysbiosis of commensal bacteria, which I will talk more about. Uh, in this study, we are also focusing on this interaction that happens with the bacteria and virus. And here we are using two surrogates, which is murine norovirus and human norovirus VLPs. A previous research by Dr. Jones, uh, who is my PI and the corresponding author of this paper, have shown that commensal bacteria can enhance the uh, norovirus infection. She showed it for in vivo in murine norovirus, where she showed that uh, when the mice were being treated with antibiotics, along with the decrease in the load of bacteria, there was also a significant decrease in viral infection. Second paper by Grau et al. from the similar lab showed that the enhancement or inhibition of norovirus infection induced by commensal bacteria can actually depend on the region of the intestine 
they saw that in the proximal small intestine, bacteria can help inhibit norovirus infection. Whereas in the distal intestine, the commensal bacteria can help enhance the norovirus infection. And this were mainly because of the variation of the bacteria which were present in these regions. Some were bile, bile acid metabolizing bacteria, some were not, and that caused all the change. Similar study, also Dr. Jones in the same study showed that human norovirus also can enhance, infection can enhance in vitro in presence of commensal bacteria. They treated B cells here with cofactors. Uh, so the first cofactor they chose was mouse stool, which was unfiltered or filtered stool. And they saw that filtration of that stool caused a significant decrease in norovirus infection in B cells. Then they focused on a particular commensal bacteria called Enterobacter cloacae, which is known to bind to norovirus. And they saw that the in norovirus infection can be restored in a dose-dependent manner when E. cloacae was supplemented in that B cell culture. Now, this impact of commensal bacteria on viral infection is not unique to norovirus. It has been shown in multiple other viruses like polioviruses, retroviruses, rheoviruses, rotaviruses, coxsackie viruses, and multiple other mammary tumor viruses and many other viruses. So it is a pretty common thing that commensal bacteria can impact the infection of enteric viruses. So as I said in the introduction that it was pretty common that viral infection can cause a large scale dysbiosis of microbiome. And it is also now known that the microbiome itself can have an impact on the uh, virus infection. But it is not known if the virus in, uh, binding to the bacteria can cause any specific changes in the genome or phenotype of those bacterial species. It was seen in previous study that human norovirus can directly bind on the outer surface of uh, gram-negative bacteria, which is Enterobacter cloacae. And not only for Enterobacter cloacae, when the study was done in a wide range, it was also seen that norovirus can bind to almost similar levels with multiple other species of bacteria which are present in our intestine. Our lab showed similar study, a uh, similar thing on murine noroviruses, that murine noroviruses can attach on the surface of the Enterobacter cloacae and not only Enterobacter cloacae, but murine noroviruses can attach to almost similar levels to different bacteria, although it was a little lower binding for gram-positive bacteria. Now we wanted to uh, focus more on what this direct binding of norovirus does to the bac particular bacterial species in terms of genomic or phenotypic changes. To do that, uh, Chanel started with RNA-seq. Chanel from our lab, she, uh, we all start with an um, experiment called bacterial attachment assay. Here, we grow a bacterial culture overnight, then inoculate the bacterial culture with murine norovirus, silver nanoparticles, or human norovirus VLPs, and incubate for one hour for the binding of uh, virus and bacteria to happen. In this case, we are using silver nanoparticles as control because silver nanoparticles are of the same size as that of norovirus. And we wanted to see if, um, if the changes that we are seeing is because of the presence of norovirus specifically or because of just the presence of random particles in the media. Then after the attachment is complete, we pellet the bacterial bacteria out and we use the bacteria for RNA-seq analysis. And this was a, the huge overall result that we got from RNA-seq in one figure but let me explain it to you what happens. So we have different treatments. We have different treatments. We have PBS, we have silver nanoparticles, human norovirus VLPs, and MNV, which are all in the top, uh, marked in the top over here. In the left, there are grouping based on differentially expressed genes. 
the orange one here says opposite trend, which means this genes were upregulated in one bacteria, but downregulated in the other bacteria, uh, downregulated in the presence of one virus, but downregulated in the presence of the other virus. And here we are comparing neuro, murine norovirus and human norovirus VLPs. The next light blue is termed as shared trend, which means the, these genes were upregulated or downregulated for both the virus. The next one in green is MNV unique, which means these genes were differentially expressed only for murine nor when murine norovirus was present in the bacterial culture. Similarly, there were genes which were only differentially expressed in the presence of human norovirus VLPs. And then the gray bar over here represents all the genes which were not differentially expressed. So we can see that there were multiple genes which were differentially expressed and most of them were either upregulated both in uh, for both the viruses or downregulated similarly for both the viruses. On a more focused analysis, what Chanel saw was that there were some simil uh, some common genes which were upregulated or downregulated for both the treat viral treatments, but there were also genes which were uniquely upregulated or uniquely downregulated when the bacteria was treated with uh, the viruses. But a common thing here was that uh, the maximum number of genes, almost 30% of the genes which were differentially expressed, belonged to the transmembrane. There were also genes which were uh, playing a role in signaling transport and cell membrane, which were very highly differentially regulated when the bacteri bacteria was attached to viruses. And we are very much fascinated and interested in these genes because of what we were seeing in our lab on the bacteria at the very same time. So in the same time when Chanel was doing those experiments, I was working again on bacterial attachment assays, but with the pellet that we obtained after the bacterial attachment assay, I was doing electron microscopic analysis to see if there are any phenotypic changes occurring on the bacterial surface uh, when the viruses was attached. What we see here is that the panel A is after 12 hours of viral attachment and panel B is after one hour of viral attachment. And this bacteria is Enterobacter cloacae. We see that in the presence of norovirus, there is an increased amount of bacterial appendages as compared to the mock. This was much more prominent for one hour, but when we quantified it for 12 hours, there was still a very significant change, uh, a difference in the appendages per bacterium for when the bacteria was attached to virus. Another change that we saw was the wrinkling activity of the outer membrane of this bacteria. We saw that in presence of the virus, the bacteria had increased depressions or wrinkles on the surface as compared to mock. In previous studies, this increase in bacterial appendages or uh, wrinkling activity was associated with bacterial stress response due to different environmental stresses such as presence of antibiotics or presence of UV rays or any kind of environmental stress can give rise to such stress response by the bacteria. And yes, bacteria also uh, get wrinkles out of stress. But what the, those previous researchers also saw was that these changes in the outer membrane of the bacteria was leading to hypervesiculation or the increase in the production of extracellular vesicles by this bacteria. So that is the next thing that we checked for our study because we were seeing changes in the membrane genes in the presence of bacteria, and we were also seeing phenotypic changes in the membrane itself. We saw that the outer membrane vesicles were produced in mock as well as under the influence of viruses. But when we collected all the pictures that we obtained from the uh, scanning electron microscopy and then quantified the number of vesicles, 
we saw that in presence of virus, the number of vesicle per bacteria uh, per image was significantly higher as compared to the mock. Electron microscopy gives us a idea, but to quantify it very well, we had to isolate out the vesic extracellular vesicles from the bacteria and then check the quantification using nanoparticle tracking analysis. To isolate the bacteria, we again did um, the bacterial, to isolate the vesicles, we again did bacterial attachment assay after which we collected the bacterial pellet, which was attached with virus or mock. And then we let it grow for 12 hours for the vesicles to be formed. After 12 hours, we pelleted out the bacteria and then we harvested the supernatant from which we isolated the outer membrane vesicles. Now, via, electron, via nanoparticle tracking analysis, what we saw is that in presence of virus, which is in blue and green over here, we saw an increased production of OMVs as compared to the mock. In respect to the OMV size, we were seeing a significant decrease when the virus was present in the bacterial culture as compared to the mock. Now, Enterobacter cloacae represents a very, very small amount of bacteria which is present in the intestine. So to see if similar trend was happening for bacteria which are more abundantly present in the intestine, we checked um, the same experiments, same treatments on B theta, which is Bacteroides theta iota micron, and Lactobacillus acidophilus. Both of them are very abundantly found in both mice as well as human intestine, and we saw that norovirus had a similar effect on their vesicles as well. In presence of norovirus, the vesicles released by this bacteria were increased in quantity, but decreased in size as compared to the mock. All of this was done in vitro. So all, naturally our next focus was to see what was happening in vivo. For in vivo, we infected mice with either mock or mirai norovirus. Uh, and at 24 hours, which is the peak infection period, we collected their feces. And from the feces, we isolated the, the vesicles. Unfortunately, there was no proper way of purifying bacteria only vesicles. And what we were getting had mammalian vesicles in them as well. So our lab designed a protocol to deplete these exosomes which were pelleted down at the same speed so that we can collect the purified bacterial extracellular vesicle only, which we need for our analysis. So what we did for exosome depletion was we used Micromax, magnetic assorted cell sorting. These be magnetic beads were marked with antibodies against um, tetraspanins. And so whatever was retained in the magnet over here was exosomes, whereas whatever was coming out in the flow through were bacterial extracellular vesicles, which were later uh, ver verified and then used for nanoparticle tracking analysis. For verification, we first checked the presence of CD9 tetraspanin and none of the vesicle obtained from uninfected or infected my stool had CD9 present in them, showing that the vesic exosomes were depleted from the sample after Micromax. Next, we checked for HSP70. And again, for all the stool-derived bacterial extracellular vesicles, there was no presence of HSP70. This showed that the depletion of mammalian vesicles was successful. Now we wanted to see if there was LPS present in our BEV samples because OMVs are very enriched in lipopolysaccharide. So we um, checked for the presence of LPS and all the BEVs that we isolated had the presence of LPS in them. After we verified that our protocol was working, we next did electron microscopic analysis of the inoculum and the 
mock as well as MNV infected bacterial infected mice stool BEVs. And then the final step was to do nanoparticle tracking analysis on this purified BEVs. And we saw a similar trend with what we were seeing in our in vitro studies that whenever norovirus infection was there, the vesicles produced by the bacteria were increased in quantity, but decreased in size. As you can see here, the small vesicles sometimes are of the same size as that of our murine norovirus. So we wanted to make sure that the decrease in size that we are seeing here is not because of the presence of virus and only because of the small vesicles. So we checked for the presence of virus in our BV samples, and we did not find any virus to be present, which means that the decrease in size that we were seeing was only because of the decrease in vesicular size only. I think I take over here. Thank you, Tanya. So next, uh, we compared uh, the protein content between the OMVs that were produced in the presence or in the absence of um, uh, MNV. And we use proteomics approach. So we're hoping that we can find out some clues as what component, components of the OMVs are different. And maybe that will give us some understanding of uh, changes to the biogenesis. So here is, as a control, we use those silver nanoparticles here, which were denoted in some ex experiments as mock. And bacteria were incubated uh, with the virus or not for the comparison or uh, with, with these um, nanoparticles, which are uh, 40 nanometer nanoparticles. And um, so then we again isolated the OMVs by the ultra centrifugation method and we lysed, uh, we lysed these proteins in OMVs, we lysed OMVs to obtain proteins by using RIPA detergent lysis, resolved the uh, proteins by SDS page, reduced, alkylated, and digested by triptych digestion. And the peptide analysis was done by HPLC in line with the Orbitrap fusion mass spectrometry. I would like to add here, uh, for those of you who are interested in analyz uh, analyzing uh, vesicular proteins, uh, we add this gel step in the, in the procedure, not as a means to re resolve uh, proteins um, and uh, fractionate them, but rather it serves as a cleanup step that helps with removing contaminants and reducing the sample variation. We have previously observed that running proteins for a short time on the sacralamide gel is beneficial, and we typically really identify more proteins uh, instead of using the in solution digest. So that's also this, the same for the eukaryotic vesicles that we work with. So in this experiment, we identified uh, 441 total proteins based on minimum two peptides and high probability sequence scores. And amongst them, 37 were uniquely identified in mock OMV samples and 66 uh, were in MNV affected OMVs. And uh, amongst these uh, 338, there were some also that were differently um, abundant in these samples. So um, next, Tano. Sorry. So when comparing the proteins of OMVs generated in the presence uh, of the virus versus nanoparticles or the mock OMVs, we found that while most of the proteins were similar, there were differences in protein content as well. So most of the proteins, around 60%, with the lower abundance in MNV OMVs, were of cytoplasmic origin. So this is shown in blue here. On the contrary, the proteins having higher abundance in uh, MNV OMVs were mostly membrane-associated, so close to 70%, shown here in red. And this really shows that the virus leads to, to increase in membrane proteins and decrease in the cytoplasmic content, which might suggest some change in the type of the biogenesis that uh, these uh, vesicles, by which these vesicles are formed. Next. Uh, so the gram-negative bacteria have really two main routes of the vesicle formation. And one of them is the blebbing of the outer membrane. And the, the other one is the explosive cell uh, lysis. 
And that explosive cell lysis particularly happens upon bacteria experiencing specific stressors such as phage. And it has been very well described for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which undergoes this explosive cell lysis that's mediated by a cryptic prophage endolysin. However, of course, for uh, Enterobacter, very little is known. Almost no publication exists for the OMV biogenesis. So the similar mechanism for Enterobacter is also currently unknown. But the presence of, uh, of DNA or cytoplasmic proteins um, in those OMVs would strongly suggest explosive, explosive cell lysis biogenesis. Next. The fact that Enterobacter MVs contain cytoplasmic content and DNA, it, it, it is not new to us. So we previously published uh, a couple years ago that these OMVs formed by, by Enterobacter in the absence of the virus do contain large number of cytoplasmic proteins as well as DNA. So this, uh, these OMVs were analyzed from the late log phase and they do contain uh, DNA as you see on the, on the right side as well. However, now we hypothesize that the interaction of, um, of bacterium with the MNV changes the, the type of biogenesis of OMV formation in some, uh, some major way, based on the size difference, the hypervesicularization, and also the changes that we start seeing in these OMVs. Next. To gain clue about the biogenesis of OMV formation, we're now going back to that RNA-seq analysis, which helped us with the examinations of genes that were differentially regulated in bacteria affected by the virus compared to, to MOC. Within these functional categories, there was a repertoire of genes that are related to the membrane stability, such as um, OMBR, DECS, um, RCSS, RCSC. And these were upregulated up by the presence of norovirus. And some other ones were downregulated, such as OMPW and some others. So the changes in the expression of these genes are associated uh, based on uh, literature with changes in the production or biogen biogenesis of OMVs in other gram negative bacteria, because again, Enterobacter very little is known. Next. We also compared the proteomic content, content of OMVs to the transcriptomic data of the parental bacteria. And several proteins were, that were absent in MNV OMVs had also transcripts downregulated in MNV ex, exposed uh, enterobacter cloacae and vice versa. But this indicated that the identified transcripts produce proteins that are related to OMV formation or content. For example, we found that virus leads to decrease in the ATP-dependent clip protease subunit in OMVs. Here shown in the blue, the blue arrow. And this protein plays a major role in OMV formation in um, E. coli. In particular, the deletion of clip, uh, this protease results in increased OMV production in uh, some, uh, some species. In E. cloacae, this gene is downregulated in the presence of, of MNV, and is one of, it's really one of the proteins absent in MNV OMVs. We also noted that virus-induced presence of proteins related to environmental stress, such as chlorinating enzyme that's formed during environmental stress, or carbonyl phosphate synthase, ABC transported arginine binding protein, and some other ones that are proteins enhanced under specific stress conditions. These data demonstrate the correlation between uh, bacterial gene expression and OMV protein content and indicate that norovirus interactions induce stress-like conditions that may cause the observed hypervesicularization and also alter the biogenesis of vesicle formation. Next. So explosive, explosive cell lysis is also indicated by bacterial DNA presence within OMVs and analysis of vesicles produced by Enterobacter reveal the presence of, of, that, uh, of the genomic DNA, further supporting the hypothesis that Enterobacter makes these OMVs by explosive cell lysis as a mechanism. Uh, so that um, we're showing again. However, in the presence, um, in the, of, in the presence of MNV, 
that uh, an amount of, um, um, uh, of DNA is a little um, inhibited, smaller. You can see that also shown on the graph on the right side. Um, so the, the amount of, of DNA is smaller in the presence of uh, the virus. Next, in conclusion, um, the nor so the, these norovirus interactions can significantly alter the bacterium, particularly bacterial gene expression, and uh, likely induce stress responses in this bacterium. The virus also changes the surface of the bacterial cell and alters bacterial vesicle production and content. The identified changes in the proteins in these OMVs combined with the changes in transcripts in whole bacteria suggest that virus uh, likely uh, alters the mechanism of vesicle biogenesis. And we speculate that MNV induces shift um, in the OMV biogenesis from the explosive cell lysis to membrane blabbing, which we still hope to support by, by future studies. And finally, I would like to uh, acknowledge everybody uh, from the Jones lab, um, especially um, the first author, Chanel, uh, Chanel Mosby, and of course, Tano, who is present here today, um, as well as other um, lab members. I'm, I have another lab and we've been collaborating with Dr. Jones for some time. Um, but other collaborators include Dr. Stephanie Kars, Matt Phillips, and Tim Garrett at UF. Of course, we also would like to acknowledge uh, the funding, mostly the R21 um, grants that funded the majority of this work. And we are very happy to take questions at this point that Tanu and I will try to answer. And I think Belisa is here also as well, so she can, she can maybe type in the chat if, if she likes. Indeed, indeed. I saw that Melissa is here as, as well. So it's good to um, ha have you all here to answer the questions that are coming up in the chat box. So just to remind everyone, um, please put your questions and comments in the chat box. And I'm going to allow unmuting now, and I will call on people um, as, as questions come up here. So um, let, let me start out. Um, first of all, this is a very interesting work, you know, and I, I think that there is... Um, still a lot to understand about the biogenesis of these bacterial uh, vesicles, um, and, and you've, you've contributed to this. So can I ask, do you have an estimate on how many uh, vesicles are being released by bacterial cells, uh, that is to say on a per cell basis? We've calcul been calculating that. For, uh, Tano, do you remember, or can you check quick? Uh Per bacterial cell, it was in the presentation, it was pretty high for B theta and L acidophilus, but it was pretty low for Enterobacter cloacae. It was uh, around one vesicle per bacteria for Enterobacter cloacae, but for lactobacillus, it was very high. It was around 10 to 13. For B theta, on the other hand, it was around three to five per bacteria. And do you think that, that differences like that are, are simply differences in the bacteria, or does this reflect uh, different biogenesis uh, pathways? So the biogenesis for gram-negative as well as gram-positive bacterial vesicles are very, very different. So that can suggest why we are seeing such major changes with uh, the lactobacillus and other of the two gram-negative. But between the gram-negatives, we do not know for sure because they, although there has been studies with B theta OMVs, but they are more, more towards the host immune response studies rather than the OMV biogenesis studies. And for Enterobacter cloacae, basically there is no study at all. Uh, we All the two studies we had with OMV vesicles, both were from our lab, but we are trying uh, to find more about the biogenesis different from them. Yeah, it's just fascinating, I think, to, to think about the diversity of bacteria that exist just in the mammalian gut. You know, we, we um, uh, as an EV field, I think most studies, as surveys have shown, are focused on mammalian EVs. Um, but to think about the tremendous diversity that's out there 
um, and to and that all of these cells are making EVs as well. It it just uh, tells us that there's a lot more to discover. Um, so now I, I'm going to go to the chat box, and I see that there are some questions here, but. Um, as we sometimes like to say, your voice is a critical addition to this discussion. So um, please don't hesitate to put your comments and questions in the chat box. So let's start here with Artem. Artem Jivalojny, do you want to unmute yourself and ask this question? Yeah, thank you. Very interesting presentation. Uh, but uh, I want to ask, and uh, uh, could you show the slide with the electron microscopy images? I think we only show here with from the stool. Right, Tano? Yeah, I see that. The, so the question was about different other yeah, structures. Yeah, I want to say that the uh, gut uh, microbiome has a lots of structures, uh, not only vesicles, terrific amount of food remains, bacterial vesicles, lots of stuff, no doubt. And based on your protocol, as I understand, uh, you pelleted uh, your vesicles and then remove the human vesicles. But what about uh, the other uh, structures? Which you even can, uh, which you can even see on your microscope images, like those uh, uh, five rails and other stuff. I think it's slide fourteen. How, how right? do you remove them? You can't, right? <laughs> I mean, you can. <laughs> you you could yeah, slide remove 14. them. Slide fourteen, Tano. Yes. Yeah, those five rails and uh, the remaining. Yeah, we try to remove them. We tried our best to remove any kind of mammalian vesicles so that the effect that we are seeing do not have any, the mammalian vesicles do not have any contribution towards that. And we did centrifugation at different speed to specifically collect out bacterial accessory vesicles, which were of a particular size and not uh, any like larger proteins or smaller impurities but there were some um, especially like fimbrial particles and stuff which did come out as well yeah i have to say that the, i mean the, the the stool work is a little more dirty than the than getting things from in vitro so what you could do is of course put them on the sucrose grade install but um we we were working with extremely limited amount of material after the initial removal of of uh, eukaryotic vesicles so this was the, the in vivo experiment that, that that was a limitation but it's a good criticism and hopefully uh, that can be that part can be improved in the future yeah probably density gradient could remove all those structures thank you the next question i see is the receptor on the bacteria or is this not receptor mediated and I think I can answer this question a little bit because uh, I was in involved in the, in, with, with the study a little too, uh, that we don't know, but at this point, I think we don't think it's a protein mediated interaction at this point. Um, there's another uh, study that uh, Dr. Jones is working on. It likely, it likely is not a protein or a receptor, it could be even polysaccharide or, or another type of structure. Yeah, previous research with Dr. Uh, Jones's research has shown that, um, again, it was not a protein, it was a carbohydrate. So in the human cell as well, there is the HGBA histoblood group antigens, which can bind to norovirus. And it was seen that there are some commensal bacteria which can produce the HBGA-like carbohydrates. And that's why that is one of the biggest reasons for us for choosing Enterobacter cloicae, because this bacteria has H carbohydrate, which is a mimic of HGBA, which is in our cells. And also it was seen that the virus can bind to those particles in the bacteria. If not, um... Thanks for the question and answer. Oh, good. Go. That, that was a great answer. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Uh, let's go next to uh, to Simon. Simon Powis. Um, Simon, so you're a you're a deputy editor at Journal of Extracellular Vesicles, um, <laughs> and you're actually asking a question that I was thinking about. So uh, so please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, my computer is overheating, so you may hear a hissing noise in the background. But yeah, thank you for considering JEV. Excellent. Very good journal to publish in. <laughs> yeah. So obviously, you know, what are these things? interacting with are they impacting another bacteria or maybe are they you know in, in 
altering behavior patterns of mammalian cells. I think it's absolutely great study. Thank you very much for that. But yeah, what next? Yeah, so so I know again speaking for Dr. Jones, who is we're actually both sick. I think one of us has bacteria, one of us has virus. I have COVID, so <laughs> so it's another viral interaction with the bacterium here. But yes, yeah, so the 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 OMVs are definitely taken up by the mammalian cells. They can be, and we are now performing study using different compounds to inhibit specific endostatic pathways in the cell to see by which um, mechanisms these, these are uptaken. But that's something. And hopefully then we could look in vivo more like people do with the with eukaryotic EVs as you can track them. I'm not quite sure what would be the best way to perform the in, in vivo experiment, whether it would be labeling by um, lipophilic dye to find out where these vesicles are going and whether the interaction of the virus makes them... <laughs> take the virus with them uh, more in, into the intestines, into the epithelial layer, or um, maybe creating a genetic tool to modify the bacterium to make fluorescent or even bioluminescent vesicles would be better. I think it seems like the genetic tools are preferable to the dyes, I understand. If you can comment on that, that would be also helpful. <laughs> Yeah, for the next steps, me and Chanel have diverted. Chanel is working more on the bacterial side of the interaction. I'm working more on the host immune response side of the interaction. And there is a new student who is working with this entry kinetics stuff. With the bacterial side, firstly, we do want to see more about the biogenesis. We want to see which factors or which genes specifically are helping with whatever we are seeing as observations. And for the host immune response side, we are more focused on seeing how the presence of these vesicles are impacting norovirus infection to the host. And we do have find we found multiple interesting things, which most probably will be in our next um, publication. Excellent. See a thumbs up there from Simon. So, uh, so nice answers. And uh, let's go from Jeff, deputy editor, to a member of our international organizing committee for ISEF 2022. Uh, Soazik, you have a couple of good questions here. Thank you for your presentation. I'm. It's a very naive question because I'm starting to get interested in feces-derived EVs, and I was wondering whether you, you, there is an interest to separate large and small EVs or whether OMVs have all the same size and depending on the biogenesis, there are yeah, no clues about this. And the second question is that you uh, say that you purify um, uh, bacteria derived DV on the basis to exclude mammalian derived DV based on their CD9 positivity. Uh, are we sure that OMV are totally depleted or free of CD9? There are no uh, genes, autolog genes that can be involved in their biogenesis in bacteria. Maybe it's totally uh, a silly question, and I'm sorry for this. All so questions are good and welcome. Definitely. Firstly, before answering the questions, I would like to say that Obviously, there is so lesser work done on bacterial EVs as compared to mammalian EVs, but now they are known to be so much important because even how your immune response is polarizing, even in the spleen or, you know, thymus, that also now has been seen to be dependent on microbiome. Your microbiome composition will tell how your immune response, how your uh, response to stress or depression will be, everything is uh microbiomic right now so after that comment that the answer i would like to say is that for the cd9 specific question uh we used a murine cd anti cd9 antibody which was pretty specific to mouse uh exosomes only for that we do not expect to see anything for the bacterial evs can you repeat the other question uh, the size is there can you separate them or is there an interest to separate them according to their size to distinguish large and small or not? Uh, we did not focus on separating on the basis of size. And I would think the density gradient or the sequential ultracentrifugation will help with that. But we did have an interest in separating vesicles which were attached to the virus versus vesicles which were not attached to the virus. And 
there is a lot of difficulty in that, but we are still trying. I think definitely it will be interesting because they may be taken up by different mechanisms too, which we're currently testing and outcomes on, on the host would be different. So that's something I think it will be very interesting. Uh, for Sudamonas, um, there were some variation in the size as well. So it's a growing field, I think. Also, depending on the biogenesis, these vesicles might have a di different density as well, right? Because um, they'll have different components present. So I don't know if size or the density would be to, to take into account as well. Excellent. Well, we have come to the end of the questions that are in the chat box. One more. I One more, please. Go ahead. Uh, you were saying that uh, then uh, bacteria-derived EVs are uh, really important in immunity. And uh, you refer to uh, some uh, microbiota-related diseases. Uh, do we have some clues that um, in the circulation, in the blood, um, we, there are some um, uh, OMVs that will reflect micro, microbiota? There has been seen presence of OMVs in bloodstream as well as in the around the blood brain barrier. So yes, they are present. They are mainly the mediators, the main agents through which the bacteria is communicating with any other host cells throughout our body. Very good. Well, then I guess we can wrap up for today. Um, so I'd like to thank you, Tanu, for a very clear presentation and for this uh, this wonderful work. Thank you, Mariola, for joining us um, and for also presenting um, and, uh, and Melissa, too. So Melissa is here. And I want to wish everybody who's not feeling so well today a, a great recovery, a quick recovery. And um, and thank you all for, for joining as well. Thank you for the good questions. Please take care, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you at a, another edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. Thanks so much and bye now. Thank Thanks you so much. Take care.